You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from theheart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for October 20th, 2017. This week, I'm talking about secondary AFib, heart failure quality metrics, bleeding rates on DOAC drugs, uncontrolled hypertension, and stroke risk factors. First up is the idea of secondary AFib. Literally, almost every day, the EP service at my hospital sees a patient with secondary AFib. That is, AFib due to something else, like an acute infection, trauma, surgery, acute coronary syndrome. The arrhythmia, the AFib itself, often resolves when the inflammatory condition resolves. But the question remains, should this patient be placed on an anticoagulant for stroke prevention? Is this the same kind of AFib? as a more typical AFib. Patients with secondary AFib were not included in clinical trials, so we don't have good solid evidence what to do. This week, NJAC-EP, a group from McGill University in Montreal, published an observational study of about 2,300 patients older than age 65 who were admitted for acute coronary syndrome, acute pulmonary disease, or sepsis, and had new-onset AFib as a complication. About one-third of these patients were discharged on anticoagulants. They followed patients for over three years, and after adjustment for confounding risk factors, they did not identify an association of anticoagulation and a lower incidence of ischemic stroke in any of the three diagnoses, ACS, acute pulmonary disease, or sepsis. They did, however, find that anticoagulation use increased the risk of bleeding in patients who, with secondary AFib and acute pulmonary disease. Now, I lead with this study because it's provocative and clinically relevant. Does secondary AFib, or that AFib that occurs for a clear inflammatory stressor, confer the same stroke risk as normal AFib? The signal from this observational study is that it does not confer as much stroke risk, but does increase the risk of bleeding at least in some. Another provocative thought here is what exactly is secondary AFib? Where is that line? More and more, we have come to realize AFib often comes for a reason. And if we treat these reasons, say obesity or sleep apnea or alcohol excess, and the patient's AFib resolves, can we then say that that patient had secondary AFib? I think the line behind what is secondary and what is primary AFib is one of the great questions in electrophysiology today. Of course, these interesting observations need to be interpreted with caution. This data from this observational study came from administrative data, and the authors note that they probably missed some cases of AFib. What's more, any time administrative data is used, it's tough to know that the study cohort included only patients with transient AFib. And of course, observational data is difficult because of confounding variables. Next topic is the issue of heart failure metrics, and specifically, how does DNR orders affect heart failure metrics? Now let's first be clear. Quality measures and what they have done to hospital medicine is one of the biggest disasters I've witnessed in my career. Taking care of patients with heart failure, especially older patients, is harder than ever. We used to have to protect our patients with heart failure from hypoxia and pulmonary edema, and of course its cousin, which is volume depletion and renal insufficiency. Now we have to do these clinical things, plus we have to protect our patients from the quality measurers whose sole aim is to keep the hospital from getting publicly dissed or financially penalized. You get nudged into making people sicker on paper or giving medicines or doing tests that you'd normally never do. This is all in an effort to distinguish one hospital from another, and the truth, the truth, which anyone with even a little experience knows, is that in the real world, almost every hospital can take care of people with venous and pulmonary congestion equally well. Sorry for that sidebar, but now let's get to the study. This was a large cohort study of more than 55,000 patients from 290 hospitals who treated patients with AFib. Jack Hartfeyer published a study, and its accompanying editorial from Dr. Paul Heidenreich from Stanford is one of the best editorials I've read this year. Please go read it. The authors looked at how early DNR rates vary among hospitals and how they confound risk-adjusted hospital mortality rates. There were three big findings. First, hospitals with higher DNR rates had higher mortality rates, a relationship that persisted after adjusting for severity of illness. And there were 22 high-mortality outlier hospitals, 
so hospitals doing badly, that were found, but when adjustment for DNR status was done, a half of these hospitals were no longer classified as outliers. Now, if you include DNR in the model used to benchmark hospital mortality, the metric improved. The C statistic went up from 0.82 to 0.845. So this just made the model better. Now, the authors conclude, given public reporting of heart failure and mortality measurements and their influence on reimbursement, accounting for the presence of early DNR orders should be considered. My guess is that the peer reviewers, who probably love quality measures, got the authors to tone down the language, hence the words should be considered. Of course DNR orders should be added to the risk adjustment formula. Better yet would be a reevaluation and study of how heart failure metrics are helping people. My Bayesian guess is that the posterior probability of this experiment would not look good for those who love heart failure measures. Let's now move on to bleeding risk on DOAC therapy. When we prescribe DOAX, the obvious concern is safety, DOAX being direct-acting oral anticoagulants. Though I don't worry about the lack of reversal for the 10A inhibitors, many doctors and patients do worry. A team of Canadian researchers published a retrospective matched cohort study from six areas in the U.S. and Canada. British medical journal BMJ published a paper and it involved about 12,000 patients on DOAC and 47,000 on warfarin who had a new VTE, venous thromboembolism. The author's propensity matched the unrandomized groups, and overall the bleeding rate was 3.3% and death rate was 1.7%, and the risk of major bleeding on either the DOAC or warfarin was similar, essentially the same. The pooled hazard rate was 0.99, and they found the same finding with death rates, no differences between DOAC and warfarin. Now, the study is relevant because even though non-inferiority trials of DOAC versus warfarin and VTE found that the DOACs were non-inferior, RCTs are not typically designed to detect differences in safety outcomes, and bleeding rates tend to be underestimated in RCTs. That's because patients with a history of bleeding are usually excluded from the RCTs. So this is a reassuring signal from a real-world sample, but the study has important limitations. One was short-term follow-up, only 90 to 180 days. The other was that 95% of DOAC users here was rivaroxaban, so we don't have good strong data on apixaban or dabigatran. And of course, these were non-randomized groups, and uh, propensity matching helps, but again, it's not the same as an RCT. Next topic is blood pressure control is not improving. The CDC has released a report on blood pressure control. Now, they use longitudinal data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHADES, from 1999 to 2016. You hear a lot on this podcast about NHANES, so I thought I would briefly explain what it is. NHANES is a cross-sectional survey designed to monitor the health and nutrition status of civilian, non-institutionalized U.S. population, and they use highly stratified, multi-stage probability designs. Surveys consist of interviews conducted in participants' homes and standardized health exams conducted in mobile exam centers. A blood pressure here was measured by trained physicians using a standard protocol on a total sample of about 5,500 persons 18 or over. And all blood pressure readings were obtained during a single exam visit. So they did the five-minute rest in a seated position. Participants had up to three brachial, systolic, and diastolic blood pressure measurements taken 30 seconds apart, and an average was used. Now, the key findings in the CDC report is that in those with hypertension, more than half did not have adequate control, as defined by 140 over 90. Hypertension control was worse among black and non-Hispanic Asian groups. Surprisingly, the prevalence of hypertension remained flat over the past 20 years. I thought hypertension would go up, but the prevalence of hypertension is flat. The prevalence of controlled hypertension actually got better from 1999 to 2010, but since 2010, blood pressure control has either plateaued or decreased slightly, so we're not doing as well. These data dovetail with another study our news team covered this week, and this had to do with an alarming increase in stroke risk factors. A research team from the University of Miami used data from the National Inpatient Survey to study trends in the prevalence of risk factors in patients who were admitted for stroke. Publishing in the journal Neurology, they found alarming rates of conventional stroke risk factors, such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking, etc., They found the prevalence of dyslipidemia has actually doubled over a 14-year period in patients with stroke. 
Now, the question for these rises in uncontrolled blood pressure and a rise in risk factors noted above is whether they are real. Choice number one is that the population is getting fatter and more sedentary and thus sicker. Or is it, as an astute editorialist on a neurology paper pointed out, choice number two, that these data actually reflect increased detection of risk factors due to greater surveillance, or in fact a sign of progress in that people are living longer and accumulating more of these risk factors due to just being older. Either way, I think that the the blood pressure story and the higher rates of uncontrolled risk factors in stroke patients once again point to the value of cultural societal changes that would lead to better eating habits, more walking, less driving, and starting from school age on. So again, I, I think public health will mostly come from public changes, not our prescription pads. So that's it for this week in cardiology. I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. See you again next week. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the Heart.org on Medscape.